idea, but I, I can't point to any. No, and I can't point to any examples of it either because, if, okay, what's the first principle of the cosmos? Attraction and repulsion. And attraction and repulsion alternate. When they alternate, it's called oscillation. It's called a wave. Uh, you get waves at the very beginning of the cosmos. What happens in culture? Waves. In other words, first there are periods of, um, let's call it dissociation, where groups are individuation on the part of groups, and then there are waves of coming together. First there are waves of the conformity enforcer, and then there are waves of the diversity generator, and then there are waves of the conformity enforcer again. And that you, you see that happening in fashion uh, all the time. And fashion's been around for a very long time, for thousands of years. Um, and that's going to happen with these groups aggregating on the web, too. Sometimes they will seem to come together um, in massive unities, like the, look at the Barack Obama campaign. It's the most brilliant use of the Internet that I've ever seen in my life. Um, he has pulled people together in absolutely astonishing ways, and he's made, little room, for, he's made room for them as individuals. Um, so I'm getting uh, emails these days from the Barack Obama campaign itself, and then I'm getting emails from individual friends saying, come buy my Barack Obama t-shirt. He's allowed them to build their own spaces and their own identity on his web pages, and then spread the message. Uh, that's a conformity enforcer and a diversity generator working hand in hand. Um, it, that, that is the first manif one of the first major manifestations in the political arena um, that I've seen of... Um, what's going on on the web. Of course, the fact that these days on shows like Washington Week in Review, you're seeing bloggers, and they are considered as important as uh, ABC, NBC, and CBS correspondents. That's radically new. Those people have been picked on the basis of two things, their ability to say something and their ability to promote it. Um, has it made us any smarter? We're going into World War III right now, and we don't even know it. Why? Because... Um, a pinhead named President Bush decided to recognize um, as an individual country a place called Kosovo. And no one in the press, not bloggers, not anybody, asked why. What was our motivation? Nobody asked. And nobody bothered to see that this is like taking Washington, D.C., and because it's 80% black, declaring it an independent state, and then giving it a military alliance with Russia. That would be rather threatening to us. And we're well, we face a, a, a long laundry list of civilization-threatening challenges at the moment, and I guess, I guess we can only hope that the enormous connectivity and then, and then the theoretically incredibly fertile uh, ground that's been created for this collective learning machine to, to, to grow and flourish, you know, we can only hope that it, it uh, actually will well, <laughs> and have some faith that it will. Global warming. Um, it's, a it, long, it's a long list, right? I mean, we are, right. it's, a, it's a scary long list right now. Ah, but what I'm talking about is look at the, cam the press campaign that's gone on to make us aware of environmental concerns since uh, 1968 when the first huge press event, the first big PR um, uh, trick was used, and that was the founding of an, uh, an annual thing called Earth Day. And it was a PR stunt. And it, but you need PR stunts. If you believe in something, PR stunt it to, for all you're worth, because if you don't, you're depriving humanity of a very vital message. And uh, the guy who put together Earth Day felt he had a vital message. And since then, he's injected, or he and, his, uh, and people like him, have injected an entirely new vocabulary into the American language, an entirely new awareness of things, a very new worldview. And that's the eco-worldview. And that eco-worldview has softened us up for um, the, the notion of global warming, which may or may not be accurate, um, because there have been 140, John, there have been 142 mass extinctions on this planet. All of them took place without tailpipes and smokestack emissions. So one way, or the, and, and we're in a weather lull of a kind that hasn't existed for a long, long time. Usually these weather lulls, these periods of climate stability, last a maximum of 10 years. Ours has lasted 12,000 years so far. We're due for a big shift one way or the other, with or without global warming. And frankly, we don't know whether it's going to be an ice age. We don't know whether it's going to be global warming. The one thing we can be sure of, it's going to be a big change. And the other thing we can be sure of is those species that are prepared to adapt to change will survive. And those species that aren't to try to make things stationary, stable, as in the vision of a Garden of Eden that Mother Nature will give us if we simply stop coughing um, smoke in her face. 
them, that's an illusion. We have to prepare for change one way or the other, and we know not which direction the change is going to go. But look what's happened to changing the entire perception of a culture since 1968. Now, in 1968, there was no Internet. There were no personal computers. And somehow this movement has grown in a very consistent way um, that, that, that seems to have been impervious to cell phones and all the other devices that have been used in its, uh, as, its, as, as the movement has gone on. And we have changed dramatically as homo technologicus. You know, since you mentioned that, I was going to point out that Paul Hawken, in his talk at the Long Now Foundation and in a couple of others, he scrolls this long list of the names of environmental organizations. And he starts it scrolling on the screen, and his point is, if I let it scroll at this rate, we'd be here for the next two weeks, because there are something like 20,000, 30,000 names on that list. And, and the point that he makes is that he feels that the environmental movement is so big that no one can even see it, and so all-encompassing, and so, so unlike other movements, because it's not political, and it's not religious. And he has a wonderful phrase for it. He says, what it actually is, is a planetary immune response. <laughs> That's, well, um, it, it, it is a new worldview. It has been propelled but successfully into the forefront. It did start as a rebel movement. It did start as just a very small group of people um, crying out in the wilderness. They worked assiduously to promote their cause. Uh, they worked for generation after generation um, to promote their cause. Um, and they've shown one of the principles in global brain is that um, subcultures each have their own individual ideas of things. They use their ideas as markings of difference. Um, for example, there are people who love George Bush, and that marks them as part of a certain group. And there are people who know that to belong to another group, they have to hate George Bush. And then there are a few oddballs like me who try uh, not to have that kind of socially bound opinion. But those groups compete with each other, and, they, and the subculture that rises to the top of the pecking order, the social pecking order, the pecking order of groups, takes over the eyes, ears, and mind of the society. And eco-culture has gone from being very much an outcast rebel culture to being the, one of the mainstream cultures of today. It yeah. has taken over the eyes and ears of a tremendous slice of humanity. Yeah, agreed. That doesn't mean it's, it's accurate. It's, another, it's a hypothesis. Um, and a more accurate hypotheses will hopefully come along. Um, the hypothesis is up against, unfortunately, with creationism and all that kind of stuff, I don't think is going to enlighten us a great deal. And hopefully, I mean, you, what you're watching here is, again, oscillation. You're watching the oscillation between conformity enforcers and diversity generators. Once upon a time, the voices in the wilderness of, ecosystem, uh, of the eco-people um, were the, the product of diversity generators. But those people have worked with conformity and forces to finally get to the point where the consensus in science on global warming being human-caused has been very rigidly conformity policed. Those scientists who wouldn't go along with the program have been hounded mercilessly. It sounds like you're saying that in the scheme of things, despite your your personal experience with the internet and the revelation that it was to you at the time um, and the enabler that it was for you in a difficult period. It was a prosthesis. Yeah. yeah it's a whole new set of limbs. But it sounds like you don't feel that it is as radical a break with the past as a lot of other people, I think, assume. Well, I think, you know, Ray Kurzweil takes us to the extreme and feels that there's going to be a moment of singularity and we will be utterly transformed. Of course, we heard that from the Christians <laughs> who thought that Jesus was going to come back and the whole world would be utterly transformed. This is a millenni uh, millenniarian view of things. And, and what I tried, the point I tried to make uh, at a conference that was set up by Bonnie DeVarco, um, at Buckminster Fuller's um, librarian or whatever you call the person who's the keeper of his archives, archivist. Um, it was set up at the San Francisco Planetarium, and I attended completely by video because I was stuck in a bed at the time. And I tried to give a lecture on the fact that, that there's been an infinity of singularities, that we go through these massive changes. This cosmos, goes, when it went from just being speed, when it went from being nothing to being speed, that was a massive upheaval. When it went from being nothing but speed to being particles,